Hello, and welcome to the Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Amanda Ono. Amanda, are you ready to be great today? I am ready. Amanda has spent a career learning to maximize the company's most valuable investment, is people. Boasting over 20 years of international experience in organizational development, HR consulting, and change management, she's implemented successful talent and leadership initiatives in six countries across four continents. You can currently find her at Resolver, a core business and worldwide leader in defining risk intelligence. Make her a mark as both a VP of customer experience and a VP of people and culture. Amanda, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm excited to have be here. So I'm going to start you off with a softball question. So a while ago, I can't remember what year, but you, you traveled to Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Japan. Can you just give us like a quick overview of your experiences traveling, the adventures you had, and the whole experience? What, what, what were you like, work, vacation, the whole, the whole story? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I had uh, graduated university. I worked for a year and a bit. And then I said, you know, it's time to go see the world. And so I took five months and, and did just that. Uh, Southeast Asia is good for travelers because it's not that expensive and you can see a ton of stuff in, in close proximity. Um, I, I kind of said in my head, I, I want to go to places that are maybe a little bit tougher to travel when I'm younger. And I'm also a huge fan of archaeology. And there's so some, you know, incredible places in the world, um, in that area of the world. Specifically, I was super keen to see Angkor Wat, which is in um, Cambodia, um, made, made probably most famous by Tomb Raider, um, but, you know, a really incredible um, piece of archaeology that, you know, humans built thousands of years ago still remains today. Um, so that was, that was an incredible adventure. I, I think I highly recommend travel to anyone who, who can do it. I think it just gives you so much perspective. You know, you, you realize that, um, you know, humans all kind of want the same things and no matter where they come from in the world. Um, and people are generally very kind. You know, we had a lot of good experiences of just kind of asking for help or saying, Hey, like, do you know where we should go next? And we always got good advice and took people up on that. And so it was a really, um, formative experience for me. Highly, highly recommend it to anyone, uh, especially say it to people that are earlier in their career, if they're like, oh, I need to, you know, take my next job and go up the ladder next. It's like, just get out, travel a bit, see the world. Um, you're, you're probably going to learn more about yourself in that time traveling than you're going to learn in, in a job or two. So, so take the advantage, take the opportunity. That's a great point. So many people, you know, that I know they're, you know, kind of young. Oh, I'll travel later. You know, I'll travel, I'll travel when I tire. But well, there's no guarantee when you retire, you're, you'll be able to travel. Or what's your health going to be like? You know, maybe you can't be on a plane for four hours, right? So I definitely totally. say do it now, right? When you can. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, instead of spending like, you know, $200 going through the bars every weekend or whatever the case may be, save up some money. And like, there's always cheap trip, cheap trip, trip somewhere, right? That, absolutely. And yeah, that's basically what I did. I just created a travel fund. I put, put money away and yeah, I think it's, I think it's a pretty incredible opportunity at a lot of friends that, you know, would extend it and go teach abroad or, you know, get, get working visas. A lot of the working visa programs are uh, really favorable when you're under 30. So, you know, take the opportunity. Um, again, I, I think I learned a ton about how to take perspectives, you know, how to be a more empathetic person. I think it helped really spark my curiosity about the world. Like when you, you see something that, you know, someone, you know, a civilization built thousands of years ago, and they basically had no, no, no advanced tooling or technology, and it's still standing today. Pretty, pretty awe-inspiring. <laughs> Reminds us maybe not to be so precious about uh, things in our lives. And so, yeah, I'm uh, all for it as an opportunity for, for people to expand their minds. I think another point too, like when you're younger, you, I mean, you carry your sleep, but if you don't read all right, don't know, like if you, maybe if you're young, you can stay at a hostel, maybe sleep on some random person's couch. Totally. Like you, when you get up, hey, he's like me, I'm not having a roommate, right? I'm not sleeping no. just any place, right? <laughs> so if I was to travel a lot now, it's going to be a whole lot more expensive than I was when I was younger. Yeah, that's right. When when we were traveling, we would often stay in, you know, guest houses that were, you know, it would be myself and the person I was backpacking with, and we would pay five dollars us a night for a room that had a bathroom inside where our bedroom was so we didn't have to share a bathroom as well as a fan so that was our standard right five dollars a night was like you could get a pretty decent uh set of accommodation um and we certainly met people as we were backpacking that were on twenty dollar a day plans 
right? So they, they could, you know, get room, board, travel, and go see cool things for 20 bucks a day. Um, you know, mind you, this was uh, uh, like 20, 20 years ago now. <laughs> so I, don't, I think inflation has changed that. But, you know, certainly there's people that can do it on a, a bootstrap and they, you know, often will do it for a year. So, you know, you, you can do it. But yeah, I, I agree with you. When you get older, uh, you definitely don't want to be necessarily, uh, you know, having a shared sink with someone else, right? <laughs> No, definitely not. Uh, have you been back to any of those countries since then? Um, I I have not. Uh, I've traveled to other other spots, um, though. Um, I did uh, so going on the archaeology uh, thread. I, I did Jordan um, to go see Petra. I went to uh, Peru to see Machu Picchu. Um, so I've definitely been to countries like that. And, you know, most recently um, with, with my work, I've been to Hyderabad in India um, a few times, which is also has some incredible things to see. India is a really special place. It's the most different from any other country I've, I've traveled so far. Um, so, you know, definitely some interesting things to see and also cool to see it from a work perspective, to see people's work culture there in combination with some of the uh, history and culture that is within that country. So your your passport's probably more full than other people's, right? It, it's yeah, I, I think I'm at like uh, 30, 30 plus countries That's great. Um, that that I've been been to, and yeah, I, I think again I've I've taken the opportunity, um, probably could take an opportunity to travel a little bit more within Canada and within the U.S. There's still so many amazing things to see within within North America, but yeah, certainly have gone gone uh, abroad a little bit more, um, but yeah. What, um, what's the, what's the country you haven't been to yet that you want to go to? Um, a country. Oh, I'd really love to go to, um, uh, Chile. Chile. I've heard really amazing things about, um, both, both Chile and Argentina actually. So I like to go places where there's, you know, a combination of, you know, good, good food, cool things to see, good people, good culture, you know, that, that combination when you can find those, I think that's a uh, pretty, pretty remarkable opportunity. What's the country you've been to that you're like, you just had a great time at this wonderful experience. Everything was great. But most people are like, what? You had a good time at that country. I don't believe you. <laughs> um, I would say probably Jordan because Jordan, Jordan is, um, be, because it's, um, where it is in the world, you know, people often associate the the Middle East with you know, political strife, which it has for you know a, a very long time. Um, but we we had a really great experience. It was extremely safe there. We found the people uh, so hospitable. Um, so yeah, we had a really great time. But people will definitely kind of scratch their scratch their heads at making that choice. Um, but yeah, it's it's a pretty incredible place. If someone's listening and they've never traveled before, they don't, I mean, I want to start traveling. What advice mm -hmm. do you have to, for them to get started? Um, what advice do I have before they get started? I would say book your first, the first night uh, that you're going to stay somewhere and then don't book much else. So, uh, because I think once you get on the ground, you can often see, you know, really amazing things that you want to, uh, explore or adventure towards. And, you know, sometimes I tend to be a planner, so this is kind of goes against what I've, uh, would traditionally do, but I've learned as, as a traveler, um, because there's just so much stuff that you're not necessarily going to see in a brochure or, um, on the web. And so sometimes when you get there and you kind of see the lay of the land, um, um, there's things you want to explore. And if you're overbooked, um, you're not going to necessarily ha get to have those opportunities. So many great things to see too are weather dependent. So you want to make sure you have a, you know, have the right conditions to go see stuff. So I would just say, don't, don't overbook, book, book a hotel for the first couple nights and then just, you know, kind of let yourself go. That's great advice. I have a cousin that does a lot of traveling and she always tells me like she travels, like she always gets like a medium price hotel. Like she doesn't get anything like, you know, like kind of ratty or whatever, because it's unsafe. But she says she doesn't get like, like something expensive too. Like she says, I'm going to these different places to explore. I'm not going here like enjoy the hotel room. room. I just need something safe and, you know, relatively inexpensive, you know. So, so, so I'll be here maybe eight hours a day when I'm sleeping, right? Maybe nine hours right. getting dressed. But I'm going to go. So why spend all this triple the money for a hotel room, you know? Yeah. Which to me totally. makes a lot of yeah. sense.
Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a, that's a great piece of advice as well. And, and kind of just what you're saying, you know, do it while you can, you know, when you're healthy and you know, it's, it's easier to, to move around when your, your, your body can do it. So, you know, go to the places that are maybe a little bit more challenging, um, while, while you can, um, because I, I definitely think there's, um, uh, sometimes, as you said, we wait till we're going to retire and that's not always, um, when we're, most able to move around to some of the most interesting places. And I know some people say, oh, you know, it's dangerous to travel to these different countries. What's going to happen to me? I'm American. You know, it's all this crime, terrorism. The odds that I have like a solo, I mean, it's probably, I mean, it's, it has to be hard to get something to happen to you in the United States, you know, than for overseas. Sure. It's very, 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 very rare. I would say. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I often look at, you know, the, the country advisories. So, you know, I'll even, look at, I'll, I'll even look at a country advisory. So I'm, I'm based in Toronto and, you know, we'll, I'll look at a country advisory once just out of curiosity, I looked at the advisory for Canada and specifically Toronto, it talked about rates of crime, which, you know, relative to most of the world, they're pretty low, but I think it was even listed as a yellow. And I was thinking in my head, like, if we're a yellow, <laughs> what are these other countries? Like, you know, so but like, quadruple Listen, I, red yeah, yeah that's right that's right with like a you know star in it or something but yeah no i think i think i think generally you, you know um you do have to look at those but you do also have to acknowledge that you know most most of those agencies are going to be pretty risk adverse as they as they should be when they're looking for a broad population but you know certainly certainly you know being aware of your environment and you know like like most decisions just try to be preventative, you know, don't go into areas you're not sure about, uh, after dark, you know, as your, as your relative was saying, be in an area where it's a safe hotel, you know, those are all things you do in any city in the world. So why would you change it? Um, one of the best pieces of advice I actually got from a, a travel doctor as I was getting vaccines to go, um, um, to South Africa was the most, the best piece, the best piece of health advice I can give someone is to wear their seatbelt. Um, because he said, for whatever reason, people travel to different countries and they just don't put their seatbelt on anymore. And the, the highest rate of accident is not getting malaria or typhoid or anything you're going to get vaccinated for. It's just, uh, it's getting into a car accident. So, you know, just being mindful of those best practices, no matter where you travel in the world. I yeah. Think it's pretty important. Interesting. And of course, you know, it doesn't matter what city in the world, if you're out by yourself at three in the morning, that's probably not the best decision you can make. You could be, I don't totally. know, you know, um, Hollywood or Beverly Hills or the Hamptons at three in the morning is probably not a good decision. That's right. Yeah, totally. So, man, let's talk, let's talk about your company. Um, so if I read this right, you've been the best places in Canada work for six years in a row. Can you uh, talk yeah, about that? Been, let's yeah, talk about top, the, all, all the hard work that went into that. I mean, six years in a row, like that's pretty impressive. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I, I think as you think about building a culture, you know, so many CEOs and business leaders say that they want to be a great place to work and they want to have a great culture. It's, you know, you, you have to put it on your website. Um, but, you know, what do you truly do to make that true? And, you know, I think as we're figuring out how to build um, Resolver, you know, first and foremost, we kind of had to say as a leadership team, what do we want our values to be? What do we really care about? And, and I think value alignment early days as you're building a culture is so important. And, you know, it's, it's a bit of a co-creation. You want to create it with the leadership team. You want to create it with the people that work at your organization. Um, but, you know, you, you have to have alignment as you're building that. Um, and certainly an agreement that, you know, it's going to evolve. Um, I think the next thing is just, you know, actually making sure there's a commitment from the leadership team to make sure building a culture um, is, is, is going to be central to, to how you add value to your customer base. And is there an investment in dollars that's going to come with it? Um, very early in my time at Resolver, um, the CEO asked me to, to review and to look at um, compensation. And so we, you know, had two companies that had been acquired and brought together. And he just said, you know, we need to build a compensation strategy, but you need to go look at, you know, where's, where everyone is at. And there is certainly some disparity that existed in our organization. And I don't necessarily think in early days it was on purpose. I just think no one was looking at it. I was the first person that was hired to, to, to build out HR full time. And so, you know, I went to the CEO and CFO and I said, you know, this is what it's going to take to, to, to close the gap. And, you know, some of our, some of our, um, compensation issues were related to gender. 
Um, and so they put their money where their mouths were and they made significant investments to make that right. And so again, I, I think for companies, you know, it's easy to say they care about gender diversity, um, but are they gonna put money and investment towards that? Um, and that was actually very defining for me early days in my role at Resolver. It made me say, okay, this is the place we're going to be able to grow because not only do we have such strong value alignment, I know the value um, comes with the, an agreement that it's uh, an investment is going to come with it. It's not just, yeah, we should do that. It's like, okay, well, we're going to have to make this right. Um, so, you know, those were two kind of foundational pieces um, that that values alignment, the investment from leadership. Um, and, and then my, my philosophy on building culture, it actually, um, I was partially inspired by a, a, a child development psychologist, which maybe seems kind of weird, but um, there's, a, there's a psychologist named Alison um, Gopnik, and she wrote a book called The Carpenter and the Gardener. And she basically said, you know, there's people in parenting who are carpenters. They're gonna, they have specs for a table. You're gonna build it. You're gonna build it to exact form and it's gonna be an amazing table. But guess what? If your wood is wrong or you put your nail in the wrong spot, the table's maybe not gonna be level. So there's some people that try to buy, build culture like that. You know, it's like very uniform. Let's build it. Let's make it super structured. If things fall out of line, get it back in line, knock it back in line with a mallet, right? But then the other mentality is, you know, you could be a gardener, you know? And so you, you have to be thoughtful about where you plant stuff and what goes together and who needs sunlight and who doesn't and how much rain you need. But once things are in the ground, um, the best you can do is create conditions um, for the plants and the garden to grow. And I've always looked at culture that way. You know, it's, it's, it's organic. It's, it's not a structure, right? And so if you don't kind of, you know, you certainly have to be intentional about what you're putting in the ground, um, but then you also have to be okay to let it evolve and, and let it have those conditions um, to be successful. So as we thought about building culture, I think there is, you know, the, that was kind of like the philosophy, if you want, behind what we started to do um, um, to start growing it. So get that values alignment, get the investment of leadership, but then have a guiding principle that we all signed up for. And that was really that we were going to be, we were going to allow culture to be both deliberate as you would when you're planting, um, but also be flexible in how it evolved. So, so obviously this is great for your employer brand. I'm going to presume that you use it like recruiting great talent, you know, come work for this best company, mm -hmm. but do y'all get anything else out of it? Like you get to go to some kind of, like kind of some kind of fancy award or some kind of award or something like that, or anything <laughs> monetarily or just, or just mainly like bragging rights. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of bragging rights. I think, uh, you, you know, going through the great place to work certification. So it's a combination of, um, doing a survey. So they survey your employee base and that accounts for, I think 80% of your score. And then 20% is, uh, based on an audit of the programs you've built. So it's actually pretty rigorous, um, to be able to get the certification. So I, I think it's a fantastic tool for employer branding. Um, we've certainly had a, a, a big challenge of our talent say, you know, we just look up the, the best places to work and you're on it. And so I saw a job opening and we applied. Um, so it's a, it's basically a, a small investment. There's an administrative fee to, you know, go through the process. It's, I think it's maybe like $2,000. So we, we do that small fee to be part of it. But when you think about the benefit we get as yeah. an employer brand, it's massive. Um, I also really like that, you know, going through the process kind of keeps us on top of our game, because when you're doing the culture audit, if not much has changed year over year, you kind of have to look inwards and say, why? Like if we're trying to be a great place to work, if we're trying to build an incredible culture, then we need to keep on investing. So if we're not seeing progression over time that we maybe need to relook at ourselves and say, how do we need to keep on pushing? I have to imagine two thousand dollars. You probably had to get. You probably have at least a ten thousand percent ROI on that, at least, right? Yeah, something like crazily you, high. Yeah, when you when you when you think of you know the if you think of you know the average you know cost per hire. I mean, when when we look at it all in, I think our average cost per hire, um, I think ranges about seven to ten k uh, Canadian. Um, so when you when you think about it that way, and we have a recruiting team, but that's you know two. 2k on hiring you know 50 to 70 people a year um, ends up being a pretty incredible investment so talk about this 
this one thing I think a lot of, well, actually, I think a lot of HR people get a lot of things wrong. But one thing I think they're wrong is they don't, like, they don't see the ports of HR and the role they has in employer branding like you do, right? Can mm-hmm. you talk about how HR should be, like, you know, helping to enhance the employer brand? Yeah. So I think certainly this is, you know, I have a bit of a non-linear career path, but one of my first roles was in marketing. And I, I definitely think that, you know, HR and marketing need a really close relationship because I agree. I agree. it's, you know, it's your employer brand for sure, but also your customers, right? And this is where kind of wearing both hats has been so valuable for me, but, you know, customers also will look at, you know, what do you say about yourself um, on your, on your career site? How do employees speak about you? Um, and so um, I, I think that's why, you know, having that partnership with marketing is so critical. Um, I, I think I think HR and people in culture plays a critical role because one of your first forms of advertising is a job posting. Uh, I know p- most people don't think about it that way, but you can make job posting super interesting. You can, um, you definitely can. And, 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 and some people just don't, they make them boring. It's like, oh, here's 20 bullet points that are like every other company that are trying to recruit out there. Um, why not make it imp- interesting? It's a form of advertising. You're already paying a provider like uh, LinkedIn or Indeed or whomever to, to post. So use the advertising dollar well. Um, I think that's a, that's a huge opportunity that a lot of people just become a bit too, um, yeah, a bit too boring about how they do posts when it's when it really is an opportunity if they they choose to make it one. So, so I just had an idea to pop in my head, and I'm, maybe someone's doing this already. But you know how you go on LinkedIn, everyone, everyone complains. You know, I was go to this company, I didn't get no feedback from Chris, Chris. But some companies actually do get back with you, right? So my idea mm-hmm. was like, suppose your company you actually have a good, you know, canned experience. Why not send like, you know, suppose um either where you either you hire someone or don't hire someone, you give them the feedback for the case to be send them some kind of a survey. Hey, can you fill that survey out and just grade us on our performance, right? And then you got to get an A below. You can put on your website, hey, 90% of, you know, Candace say we have a great experience, right? I don't think anyone's ever done that before. Yeah, I, I I love that. We we do um, candidate experience for people we've hired, but actually it's a really interesting cohort, the people that weren't successful. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you one of the best compliments we've received is someone that wasn't successful in a posting and we gave them the feedback, but they referred their friend um, for another posting. Um, that to me spoke volumes about the experience that they had had um, coming in because, you know, a lot of times it's not nice to be rejected. No one really wants to be, but yeah. it kind of kind of shows that they had a good experience but yeah I, I think you know a, a lot of people um a, a lot of people aren't necessarily thinking about the experience end to end and and listen it's it's hard there are times you miss giving feedback and you know that that's the time that someone posts about yeah. <laughs> on LinkedIn about oh that one day you're a human and you forgot um so I, I think so much of it is like how do you create the system you know how do you create a process for closing um, closing requisitions, right? Like, I, yeah. I think that's a key part of the process. We spend so much time on the top end. I think the back end is just as important. Um, you know, for me personally, when when I'm part of a, a final interview round, I offer to give feedback personally. Um, I, I find it surprising that I would say probably only 30% of people take me up on that offer, um, which they're, I, they're, I they're probably it, They're probably scared of, you know, the feedback, you know, some people can't take take good feedback, that's, you know. That's, that's true. That's true. Yeah. And I think, you know, to get back to your your point about building you know culture um i i think we've we've so um we've so focused on building a culture where feedback is part of who we are. And I, and I think it's a great opportunity for candidates. You know, if um, I, I had, I actually did in a candidate feedback scenario, um, it was someone I knew I'd, I'd referred her into a role. I had recused myself from the process, but the feedback on her was not who I knew her to be. And so I gave her that feedback. I said, you know, it's really interesting. I know you to be, you know, funny and very inquisitive, but in the interview, you came across as very straight laced, very direct, no sense of humor. And again, I know this woman, I've known her a long time. She is an absolute riot. And, you know, she, she paused and she reflected and she said, you know, I think I was just trying to be so professional and so um, really demonstrate my expertise that I forgot that I just also need to be human. 
right? So, you know, it's that small piece of feedback that can totally um, change someone's, you know, career trajectory that I think is so important. So, you know, wh whenever, whenever we can, I, I think, you know, both the art of giving feedback, but as well receiving it is so critical um, for your growth, but you're right. It's hard. No one likes to be hurt. No one likes to be told maybe they're not doing uh, what they hope to do, but, you know, I've, I've rarely been in a circumstance where feedback when delivered well didn't make me better. I know what I think. What I'm saying a lot of candidates have to realize, or don't, or they don't realize, like, and I might be making, making this number up, but I think every application gonna have like 200, 250 applications, right? If you have yeah. a company with like 10 job openings, that's over 2,000 applications, right? I mean, how do you like respond to every person individually, right? As a person, right? It's next to impossible, right? And I think yeah, a lot of people need to sure. realize that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think, I think part of it is, you know, certainly, um, you know, most systems like our system has an automated feature where you can, you know, respond to, to candidates. Um, and listen, most candidates know that's a canned email, um, but there's nothing preventing you from making it a good email, an email that's funny, yeah, exactly. right? Like why not even say, you know, like we know this is a canned email, but we at least want to get back to you and here's why. Um, and these are the things that, you know, you can do for the future. Future. I, I think, I think, you know, part of employer brand and showing who you are, are if, 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 you know, you are a, a company that it wants to be fun and playful is do that in all your comps, because it will, it will show up and people will remember it. You know, the, the, the standard email of thank you for your application. <laughs> uh, I mean, that, that can be pretty deflating on the candidate side, at least make it interesting, at least yeah, make it fun. You have a great resume, however, is not greater than the person we hired. Or that's something like that's that, right. right? The, the other 199 <laughs> people, right? It's like, yeah, I mean, it's not going to make someone feel special for sure. So talk about the points. Another thing I think HR people get wrong. They're like, talk about the points of HR people making sure their own employees have a great customer experience when dealing with the HR department. Yeah, I, I think, you know, HR has gone through such an interesting um, evolution. I mean, one thing specifically for us, we were pretty mindful of when when I when I came in to the to the um, uh, HR team, we actually decided to call the team talent um, rather than HR. Um, and, and fast forward, we call it people and culture. Um, one of the reasons is, you know, human resources is, you know, it's, it, it's a bit of an older term, but it's also, it, it feels like it's something that goes on a profit and loss statement. It's a resource that can be depleted, <laughs> right? Um, and I, I don't necessarily think that fully encapsulates the strengths of what, a, a, what an employee base brings to your business. Um, but, you know, I think I always say to the team, you know, we exist because we have um, employees and the more employees we have, the bigger our team will get and they are our customers. And so I think it's also, you know, making, you know, instilling that in the HR team, you know, we're not here to do administration. We're not here to make people's lives more difficult. We're in fact here to make people's lives easier so they can focus on doing incredible work for our customers. And so I think it's about instilling the customer centricity into an HR team. And I think it's coaching on it. You know, every, every person's going to have a bad day. I mean, as we were building our referral program internally, one of the most common pieces of feedback that we got was, you know, I referred someone to their a recruiter and they didn't like them because, you know, they didn't have the credentials, but, you know, why didn't they talk to me about that? And so, again, we had to kind of say to the recruiting team, okay, you need to give really clear feedback on why we didn't select this person's referral um, because you want to create the behavior where they're a customer and you want them to return. You want them to refer someone in a future state um, if they're good. But if you're not giving good service, then they're not, they're, they're not going to refer again. So I think it's, 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 both, uh, it's both having the philosophy up front as well as coaching to it. Um, I think you can certainly also, you know, survey it. You, you know, we, we do it with our hiring managers. We ask them, how are we doing? Um, you know, are we giving you what you need through the process? Is there anything we would, we could do better? So I, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's building the process, coaching to it, and then, you know, continually uh, asking and evolving it is what's going to get you the results. So, so I have a philosophy and I'm going to tell you what it is. You can agree or disagree to what you think. Okay. So, and this is not based on age, but based on mindset. So I think there's old HR versus new HR, right? Old HR, you know, you're working nine to five. Answers already know. Someone says, hey, HR, um, did you know that Jason's I was thinking about creating marketing? What do I care? I don't work on marketing. I work at HR, right? If they work in a production plant and they never get on the floor, whatever the case may be, 
or new HR, they're like, you know, compliance is important, but they try to find out say yes. They know everyone by the first name. They're always real life. Now, number one, they're not working like 12 hours a day, you know, because they can burn out, but they make themselves available. I think the biggest difference is this, like suppose you have a customer, uh, employee, we'll call him Jason. Jason works for you. Jason's the best guy for you. Like he's the one employed by far, right? But he misses three days of work. And you have a company rule that says anyone misses three days of work, the automaker fired. Old HR is going to say, hey, he's fired. I don't care, whatever. New HR is going to be like, well, can we at least find out what he's missing? Like, what's going on? It's just like Jason. And even if the CEO says, hey, HR, man, I know we messed up putting this rule in there, but the rule's the rule. We have to fire him. New HR is going to say, okay, I understand. We got to fire him. There's nothing the same. We can't bring Jason back the very next day and keep everything the same. I, so I think there's a big difference between the two. For sure. Yeah, I, I totally, I totally agree. And I would, I would, I would supplement that by saying, you know, new HR, because of their approach is going to have a seat at the, the uh, as a, as a business leader at the table, because if you don't care about your employees and the marketing part department is continuously drained of people, uh, you're not going to be able to go get new customers <laughs> and people are really going to care when your marketing team can't go get new customers. Um, you know, and that very much goes back to the, the carpenter or gardener philosophy, right? I think it's like, you know, it's, is it a, is it a rule or is it a principle? And as we were building out our culture, we really focused on the concept of having guiding principles. And so, you know, we called them guiding principles rather than policies because our, our, our belief was we hire adults, we hire adults that you're, you're going to make the decisions that are the best for the business. And we also hope the best for you. And in that there's gray area, right? So, you know, maybe you plant in your garden, a certain kind of seed, but then all of a sudden tomatoes and basil pop up. Okay. So you cut it down. No, you're like, Oh, look, we can make like an amazing marinara. (laughs) Right. Um, I, I think it's just I think there is an agility that HR has evolved to understand to really be partnering with the business. Um, you know, I, I certainly have worked in places where, you know, the, the HR practitioner um, would, you know, had sent an email to, to my boss telling me it was, you know, three o'clock on a Friday and I wasn't sitting at my desk. And, you know, she emailed my boss who sat in a different location and said, oh, did you know Amanda's not sitting at her desk? It's 3 p.m. on a Friday. Did she, did she book time off? Um, of course, which to my boss replied, well, of course, she wouldn't be sitting at her desk. She was on the phone um, with Singapore this morning at 6 a.m. Did you see her when she was sitting at her desk at 6 a.m.? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was just, again, that mentality that, you know, why do we need to be nine to five, you know, workers need to work in different environments to be able to serve the, the different internal customers that you have. Um, and I think, you know, if HR is rigid about how they see their employee base, people will just leave um, because there's so many great teams that are, that are supportive and empathetic and understand um, the realities that, you know, there's, there's certainly rules. And again, you know, we have guiding principles on how we want our employees to operate. And we, we very much, we coach very heavily when people go outside of what we deem to be the spirit of the guiding principle. Um, But at the same time, it's, it's usually just education. It's not someone trying to be malicious about it. And I think, you know, old HR um, believed that people were maybe trying to, you know, um, you know, maybe we're, it was going to have bad intentions. And I think, you know, we've built our culture under the belief that people generally have positive intentions and maybe sometimes they get it wrong, or maybe sometimes they have a personal circumstance that they can't quite share with us fully. And it is meaning that they have to take those three days off. Um, but you know, that's okay because on aggregate in, in the period of a year, do they do great work? And if the answer is yes, then, you know, we have to be flexible. We have to be flexible to their reality. Yeah, I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to do a bad job today. They have good intentions, but once they do their job, some of their job, you know, either bad resources, bad people, they change their way they do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I just, yeah, I mean, just to build on what you're saying, I generally think that people wake up and want to do a, a good job. They want to do good work. And so it's our job to make sure they, they have what they need to be successful. Um, and if someone wakes up and says, like, I kind of want to be crap at my job today, well, it's probably time for them to move on. So then, you know, you just as a manager have to be able to identify that stuff um, so you can, you know, support them to, to move on and, and go somewhere else. Yeah, but it, it does seem like nine to five is going to be an outdated, you know, thing pretty soon if, if it's not already outdated already with all the stuff going on in the world. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, you know, 
probably one of the biggest silver linings with COVID is that it made people realize you don't need to sit in an office every day to be really effective. You don't need to be nine to five to be super effective. And actually, you know, what our, our decision moving forward at Resolver is going to be hybrid. So, you know, you can work remotely, you can go into the office a couple of days a week. I, I love hybrid. I love being the flexibility of working from home, but I also love the, the opportunity to go see other humans and to, to collaborate. Um, but yeah, I, I certainly think how how we think about the the structure in which work needs to exist is totally different now, which I think was probably long overdue. Um, but we were just part of this like you know very grand experiment, and I think that's coming going to come out on the other side that work can be more flexible than maybe we originally thought. So me like I, I'm a, like an introvert, introvert, right? And even mm-hmm. I after a while like man, I need to talk to someone besides my wife wife and yeah. kids, right? I need to see someone else. Like I thought it'd be the greatest thing ever. It was for the first couple of months. I thought, okay, I'm going that batch of crazy. I need to see someone else, anyone else. That's, that's right. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's, you know, as we were going, um, you know, uh, probably three members are, of our executive are highly introverted and they were saying, yeah, same thing. This is going to be great. Let's go remote first. Don't worry about going back to the office. We don't need it. And same journey. They said, you know, oh, actually introverts do need connection. <laughs> It's just, they need different kinds of time to recharge. Right. And I think that's also like, it's actually, you know, uh, remote work has raised really interesting conversations about what introversion and extroversion is and how it shows up in the work uh, and the workplace. It doesn't mean that you don't want to talk to other humans. It just means that you have to recharge differently. So um, yeah, in, in that, in that way, I think hybrid work can be fantastic for introverts because they get the best of both. Yeah, I remember it was someone put somewhere like the extroverts, right? And like they're all going like that's your crazy, right? Introverts say, you know how you feel now? That's how we feel around people, right? So now you get right. the opposite effect. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I I I, I like I definitely like my downtime, but I, I do like being able to see people. I think having to have onboarded people remotely has been a really unique circumstance. I, I certainly had people that directly reported to me that I didn't meet face to face for nine months. Um, you know, that's so different, right? When you're, you know, especially when you build your, your culture around a place and the relationships that you have. And so I think, you know, so many workplaces were forced to be super intentional about how they built relationships with people, how they onboarded, how they followed up, how they coached, you know, all those things needed to be true. Otherwise you'd have this really disconnected and disengaged workforce. Yeah. Or you meet someone for, you see, you see someone on Zoom for like a whole year, meet them for the first time. I didn't know you were six, six. Yeah, that's right. Like that, right? <laughs> so we had a water cooler with one of our teams one day uh, and you know how Zoom has the polling feature. So we actually asked like guess someone's height. So we did like five, three, you know, five, six, six feet. And that was like kind of our range for most people on the line. So it was a hilarious game to play for people's heights. And so, yeah, we, we came to the conclusion that people have their emotional height, which is how they sound on Zoom and how they look <laughs> on Zoom. And then they have have their biological height, which is like, okay, I know that you're actually that tall. So yeah, no, it's, it's definitely, we've, we've certainly had that experience uh, as well, meeting people coming back to the office. So what are your thoughts on this? Right. So it's like, every like at least once or twice a year, be in the news, some CEO of a tech company, a big company, like do some unethical, immoral, you know, drive a company with mud and always, and always someone will say, or a lot of people say, where is HR? At? How come HR didn't stop it? I'm always like, I'm pretty sure 99.9% of the time, the HR person try to stop them, right? They try to advise them not to do it. And the CEO probably said, you know, either ignored them or said, hey, don't talk about this because like HR people, we got mortgages too, right? You just can't, mm-hmm. you just can't randomly fall, you know, fall on your sword, right? You've got pills to pay economics, right? I just, it was a pet in my mind. People say, oh, where's HR at? Like, I just don't get that part. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's, I think it's so challenging in the sense that, um, you know, were, was was the team willfully blind? Did they try to speak up, um, but no one listened? Um, you know, did the company have a whistleblowing um, um, policy to make sure people felt safe? You know, I, I think those are all the mechanisms that you do need to put into um, a business. But uh, in, in my experience, um, you know, toxic cultures, um, where you have leaders that are making bad decisions or, you know, we're still unethical decisions. Um, typically people aren't super surprised, um, because there's certain 
there's certain traits and decisions you've made them that you've seen them make beforehand that would lead you to believe that it's not so surprising. Um, I think certainly when I've heard of cases um, and things happening, people are like, oh yeah, that's not surprising <laughs> um, because you've created, you know, at some point in that culture, in that, that company's history, there's a culture where, you know, negative behavior and, you know, um, unethical behavior is normalized or made to be okay if you're still performing. And so, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's actually a really key role that HR has to play to determine what it looks like to address, you know, what we call the competent jerks, right? It's like, well, what do you do with those people? And, you know, I, I often, often when people ask me about culture, you know, I think one of the defining, um, defining factors you have to have is how, how do you agree you're going to terminate people? And, and at what point, and I know it's like, you know, most people in HR don't like talking about terminations because then they're assumed to be the grim reaper that that's, that's all we have to do, but it's actually a super important part of, of culture. Um, I think it was articulated really well by Jim Collins and good to great. You know, he said, if you have, if you have, you know, people on your team who aren't that good, you know, he calls them the B players and no one terminates them. Then the A players leave because they say, why am I here? I'm working really hard. And these people, are maybe making bad decisions or maybe they're jerks in meetings. And so then you're left with the B players. Um, and then when the B players start becoming some bad actors and they don't get terminated, they leave and then you're left with the C players, yes. right? And so your company starts to erode. And, and I've actually seen it at a couple companies I've worked at, unfortunately, where, you know, they just, they couldn't make a tough decision. Um, and the result was people left because, you know, you, you start to look around and say, why do I, why am I here? Why, why would I work next to someone who's not as committed, who's not as passionate, who's not doing amazing work for customers when I could have, you know, that company over there, where maybe I could be recognized a little bit more. So, you know, as much as most HR people don't want to talk about it, I, I, I often get quite curious about people's principles on termination, um, because I, I think that's a very telling sign of how you build a great culture. Um, and, it, and it is tough. It's tough to make decisions, especially for people who are good at their roles, or maybe very senior in the organization, or maybe very well liked, but they, they could be extremely toxic and have, you know, much bigger uh, effects, especially on your employer brand, if you're not really mindful of their position in the company. So Amanda, how would you deal with this situation? Like suppose you have 10 salespeople, right? One of them is bringing in like, we'll say 80% of the sales. All the nine only bringing in the other 20%. So the mm -hmm. guy bringing 80%, he's like, he's just an actual joke, toxic. No one likes him, right? Like, do you just, do you like terminate him and lose 80% of your sales? Of course, people say, oh, people will pick it up, but I mean, he's such a high performer. You know, how do you deal with that incompetent, like that competent, brilliant jerk, so to speak? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I've seen, I've seen actually, this is like such as the scenario like plays out like time and time again. Um, so one strategy I've seen is you just kind of isolate that person. Um, you know, you let them do their own thing and have their bag and their book of business. Um, you know, the challenge is, is you start to create an equity where people look around and say, why does that person over there get to be treated differently than me? And we're all working really hard. Um, I, I think there's a practical implication where you, of course, you have to protect the business. So I, I think the role is to really determine how you double down and train up the other nine people on your team to fill that gap. Um, because certainly, you know, if your, your quota is hundred K nine, nine people hitting hundred K can supersede a top performer pretty quickly if they're not the right person. Um, I mean, I would also probably kind of you know, challenge ourselves to say, like, has that person been given feedback? Um, oftentimes when people are really good, just no one's told them like, hey, I don't know if you're aware of this, but, you know, in meetings, you can come across as a jerk to people that are new. And that's probably not your intention, but we want you to be a leader here. So what what is it going to take to get you that way? Um, I, I think there's a there's an approach of radical candor um, where you can give someone the feedback. And I, I actually have had those conversations with people and they have been absolutely floored um, that they were perceived that way. So sometimes it's just like, you know, have, has, has anyone had the courage to give them the truth? And if you have, and they're still like that, like try it again, you know, it's not, 
you're not going to create coaching magic in one conversation. Um, but while you're having those coaching conversations, I think, you know, in order to make sure you're managing the business, you know, you better be doubling down to, to train up the rest of that team because that person is not going to be successful um, ultimately for your culture. Um, I often find too, when those people ultimately leave, they, they can become quite negative about your employer brand on market. And so you just also have to be mindful of that. You know, you could be just kicking a, kicking a bad decision down the road. Um, so it, it, it takes, it does take courage, but I think, you know, you first start with coaching and having those conversations and then while simultaneously training the rest of your team up, um, um, to close the gap. How many times does this happen? You know, a manager will say, so-and-so keeps on doing everything wrong. They're not working out. You know, they need to go. Well, have you told them that? Well, no, I have. Well, how do they know? They, they know what they're doing wrong. So you're telling me they know what they're doing wrong. But they keep on doing it over and over again. Like what kind of logical consensus does that make? Go have a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, I, I think, you know, I think it's so critical for managers to set up that those expectations and for the organization to be really clear around what success looks like. And, you know, that, that is, you know, just to your point, the first conversation I have with the manager, when they tell me they have someone that's not performing, I ask them like, how's the feedback been going? How, how have you clarified expectations? How, how often are you following up with them? How often are you, you know, giving them feedback on specific work samples? You know, I'm almost always going to go back to the, to the manager or the, the, you know, who we call coaches. I'm going to go back to the coach first and understand how they've been trying to support them. Because if we, if we hired them and we put in the investment to hire them and we do spend, you know, a lot of time hiring the right people, um, then let's, let's make sure we've enabled them to be successful. Um, and, and I truly think it is the, the manager's role um, to do that. I mean, we certainly look at, you know, a, a turnover by manager um, and where we see patterns, we want to support them. Um, on the other side, we look at, you know, I think one of the best metrics of, of management is how many times do people on your team get promoted or get to take on new opportunities? Um, to me, that's a really good sign of a good coach because it means you're, you're really enabling that person to be successful. But I, I'm totally with you. Uh, a manager that tells me they have someone that's not performing, my my first five questions are to the manager <laughs> about how they've been enabling it. Um, and it does happen that sometimes, you know, the person is not um, necessarily a fit for your organization. So you have to learn, okay, what are we going to do differently next time? But, you know, um, I, I think that the, the the expense that comes involved for recruiting someone, for onboarding them, you know, if the manager is not enabling them to be really successful, then we've, you know, really missed the mark. How about the points of companies provide like coaching or training to their managers? Yeah, so it's it's such an important part of building a great culture. It's actually one of the first things um, as we were building Resolver um, up that we did. Um, so we actually, so when I started at Resolver, we were 90 people. Um, and so we had a pretty small cohort of managers. I think there was maybe 10, 10 or 12 managers. Um, so I actually built like a very, um, very hacky uh, coaching uh, course. Uh, it came from that background, but I said, okay, we're small. I'm one person, you know, I'm kind of managing a bunch of stuff. What can we do to get these um, managers enabled? Able to be coaches. Um, so the first thing we did is we did uh, an emotional intelligence assessment. We actually helped them understand, you know, who they were as leaders and, you know, how they, how they, you know, might reflect on themselves and reflect on building relationships with others. And then we put them through a series of um, three or four workshops to help them understand how they could Im impact performance. Um, we then really instilled a, a culture of one-on-ones. So the expectation, and this was coming from leadership was that you're going to have a one-on-one -on -one once a week with your team. If they're maybe more seasoned once every other week, but we really said like, you know, you can't be effective, you know, supporting someone's growth and supporting business outcomes if you're not talking to them. And I, and I'll tell you the amount of people I interview that tell me that they haven't spoken to their direct manager in like six to seven weeks, I just find like completely appalling. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so a one-on-one -on -one culture was really important. Um, and, and then the key, you know, kind of system that we built under that to make sure it could really be, you know, de developed and continue to foster was how do you give performance feedback? 
And so we set up a quarterly performance check system where four times a year, um, you know, managers and self were giving feedback on how are we doing? And then peers were giving feedback. So we called them uh, QPC, so quarterly performance checks. And, you know, what that allowed us to do is to help people coach forward, not go back in history and talk about something that people couldn't change in time uh, and only talk about once a year. But to really talk about four times a year, you know, what are you doing well? What do you need to improve upon? How can I support you as a coach? Um, you know, when you build that and you grain it into your in your culture, you know, all of a sudden your organization starts to, to, to level up because you're really enabling, you know, the people that you've hired into your business to be successful. You know, you're giving them to go back to that garden analogy, you're giving them all the sun and water that they need to really grow. So, Amanda, you've had a great career, worked for, worked, some, worked for some great companies, but I have to assume you've worked for, for some not so great companies. Also can you talk, true. Can you talk about the difference, differences between effective and ineffective organizations? So I think one of the key things is alignment at the leadership level. Um, organizations where the leadership team is not aligned and they don't respect each other. Like you see that dysfunction cascade through the rest of the organization. Um, I've certainly, you know, I've been part of an organization where there is definitely a faction at the leadership level. There's one group that had one belief. There's another group that had another belief. Um, and rather trying to, rather than trying to figure out what's our common goal and how do we achieve it? I think they just kind of operated a bit separately. And, and I think that is ineffective and it's very hard to have growth, um, when that belief is there. So I think, you know, lack of leadership alignment, that's, that's a huge part of it. Um, I think there's a piece around, you know, what is the direction, um, which often people call strategy that your, your company is trying to go in, you know, and, and I think a lot of times you have a couple of people who are part of your leadership team who have a very defined view on growth and strategy, but do they communicate that to the rest of the business? Do they get people excited about where you're trying to go and who you're trying to be for your customers and your market? I, I think it's, you know, strategy it only, you know, becomes real when you start executing on it and when you inspire other people to execute, you know, as an organization. Um, so I think, you know, that, that alignment at the leadership level really kind of moves through the organization if it's not there. Um, and, and I think, you know, the final piece, which we kind of touched on is organizations that don't have the courage to exit people that are not effective. Um, they can become really toxic and it spreads, spreads all around the organization. Um, and, and so I think, you know, again, not, not having the courage to make those tough decisions can be a huge driver in toxic cultures. I mean, everyone says fire fast, right? But no one does, right? It's like, well, we can't yeah. fire Jason. It's his birthday. It's his wife's anniversary. It's, <laughs> it's fill in the blank reason, right? And my thing has always been, if it's come to your mind that someone needs to be fired, the whole company probably has been known for a long time before you ever came to your head. Totally. Yeah. And I often tell managers when they're struggling with this, I, I often, you know, because one of their first you know, um, objections is going to be, what's the team going to think? It's going to really be negative on morale. And I always say the first thing they're going to say is why did it take you so long? Exactly. Because when they're a peer, they see it a lot more than you do. Um, so I actually, um, uh, Laszlo Block in his work rules book, he articulated this really well, because when I started at Resolver, I, I was having a hard time getting myself in the mentality of like, okay, we're going to have to build a team where occasionally we have to fire people. And that's really sucks. It's the worst part of the job. Um, but he articulated it really well because he basically said, listen, like, if you're not terminating someone, they're going to stay at your company, which essentially is, could make their skills really obsolete because they're not going to the next role where they're actually going to ha be happy and they're actually going to do really good work. Um, so you're preventing them from growing. And so as hard as it is, you have to let them go to a job that's a better fit for them. And if you're at a point where you need to terminate them, it's because they no longer have the skills or requirements that you need to, you know, deliver. And so if you've tried to coach them and you've tried to develop them and they're still not going to make it, they need to go to a job where they fit better and they're going to be happier. You know, it's not just your business is going to be happier. They're, they're going to be happier. Cause as we talked about before, you know, no one gets out of bed and says today, I'm going to suck. Like I'm going to be terrible at my job. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. That's definitely a great, great mindset to have. 
uh, Amanda, next, how often should a company look at their values? Once a year, once to two years, every month? What's, what's your take on that? Oh, that's a good question. So I, I think values are kind of pillars that you, you have in your business. Um, when we went through this as a business, we re-looked re at them after five years, which is maybe a bit long. Um, I think probably reviewing how they look annually, but it's actually not because you're necessarily going to change them. If you, unless you believe they should change. Um, but I think what's really important with values is helping define how the value shows up. So, you know, you can put a value like, so one of our values is collaboration. It's, it's probably one of the things that we do best. I, I find resolve rights are super helpful. They really connect and they try to work together. And we've been, you know, non-hierarchical on purpose so people could really collaborate. But I think defining like, what does it mean to collaborate? And actually saying, you know, collaborating isn't just getting in a room together and like being in a meeting. <laughs> it's the fact that when you're in the meeting, you're gonna have a decision you're, you want to make you're going to be challenging, challenging each other respectfully. You're going to be working to move towards a common goal. So I think when you relook at stuff annually, as your business evolves, you'll understand how your values show up in practice also evolve. And I think that's the important work because sometimes otherwise values can feel too conceptual for people. That's often why they hang out on a website or on a wall and they don't do anything for people. It's like, tell me what the value means. Tell me how it shows up. And also tell me what it means when it doesn't show up. Right. So I I've certainly been part of performance conversations where I've said, like, I, I really, I really struggle to see you not living our value of collaboration. And this is why. And, and so I, I think you have to be able to have the conversation both ways, um, but to be specific about it is, is how your values are going to continue to um, propagate through your organization. Amanda, why is change management, change management so hard? Oh, it's the people, <laughs> right? We always make this joke. If only there were, you know, people, if you're doing a change, everything would be easy. Um, so uh, you know, we, we've been through, I mean, one of the things that I've just, you know, loved in my career is helping organizations move through change um, because it, it, it truly is the, the only constant. Um, and I, I, think it, I think it's hard because our, our brains tend to like structure. Structure makes us feel safe. And when you come in, you disrupt a structure and you make someone look at something differently, it feels uncomfortable. And again, like humans don't generally like to feel uncomfortable, right? So I, I think I think it's it's because, you know, oftentimes we look at change as this point in time, right? So a perfect example for us is when we've acquired companies. So here's this small change. We're going to acquire a company. They're going to have a new owner. Well, that's just the beginning because you now have to go through, okay, well, well what is what is the what is the what are the processes we're trying to change? What are the team behaviors we're trying to drive? What are the cultural values we're trying to drive? What are the insights and data we need to support all these things? So it's, it's so complex. And, and I think, you know, the term even change management, it makes it seem like it's a system, um, which it is, but it's not, it's, it's not so mechanical, right? Like it, it, it's, it's very complex because people work within the system. And so I, I think that's the biggest challenge with it. I think people often also under index on how long change will take. If I think of, you know, companies we've acquired, I would say, you know, a full integration for the change to be felt and to be real was two years. You know, that's a lot of time and people run change management playbooks that they say, okay, 30 days we're integrated. It's like, no, no, no. Okay. So maybe you're set up on email in 30 days. <laughs> so it doesn't mean like the change has happened. Right. Um, uh, we were at an all hands meeting in early, early resolver days. And I was going through, you know, the traditional, um, the traditional flow of change management, how you go through excitement and then you go through the valley of despair. And then you move through understanding that you're going to be cautiously optimistic. And then you kind of normalize, um, and, and someone who'd, who'd come into the business came up to me uh, at the end of, uh, at the end of my, uh, workshop. And he said that, that really resonated with me. I'm, I'm, I'm in the valley of death right now. 
And I said, it's, it's the Valley of Despair. And he said, no, it feels like death. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, now we know where we're starting. So let's move you, move you out of there. Um, but, but I do think, you know, you, you can't say to people, be passionate and be engaged about work. And then you make a change and not think that it's going to have a level of emotion in it. And, and that, that is, you know, truly humans bring the emotion to change, which, which is the challenging part, but also the most rewarding part. Because when you come out on the other side, it feels so great, right? Yes. I used to volunteer as a nonprofit, of, you know, recently. And we used to be on Slack, Google, and Zoom, right? And like overnight, they switched everything to Microsoft. It was just whole horrible. The experience was horrible. Like, do you ask anyone our opinion? Like, did, can you give some training? Have to file? It was just complete chaos. It was just such a terrible experience. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's super common where people think implementing a technology is just an on-off switch. Um, you know, if you're, you're really going through a change, you know, uh, like communication is number one, you know, are you communicating that you're going through the change? Have you asked people what they need in the system? Have you started preparing them? You know, this is, this is kind of my world now and in, in customer experiences, we help, you know, um, configure and implement technology for our customer base, but it's the same thing. And again, I think people often just don't understand, you know, you, how many hours a day are you spending in a system? right? You know, your neural pathways get super sticky being able to navigate those systems. And as, and then you're now going to switch me to a different system. I now have to like, you know, look at a different UI. I have to see things that I'm not used to seeing. I don't know where to click. I used to be super fast at this technology and now it's like terrible. So yeah, I, I think that's a, a huge part. I mean, obviously coming from my space, I'm a huge fan of technology, but I think there's a way to do it. So it can be really part of a change that's positive. Um, and that typically starts with, you know, why are we making this change? You know, what are we trying to achieve with it? And let's get people excited about it. Um, but yeah, tech is, um, you know, tech when done wrong goes super wrong. And then the, the, the most challenging part is people often blame the tech. They're like, oh, that tech sucks. I don't like it. But it's like, it was actually the change program that sucked. It wasn't the, <laughs> wasn't the actual tech, right? Yeah, what, what made it worse? After the change, they did a survey asking us what, what we use for computers, right? You think they'd do that before the change. Right. <laughs> but like 80% 80, 80 of us were Apple people, right? And they had never, and I think 60% of us like hadn't used Microsoft products like, like years, right? So you think they would ask that before the change, maybe like do some kind of plan, but I, I don't know. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's a big thing. Again, like people, you know, as I said, they under index on the impact of the change. And so, you know, have you actually put a plan together? And it doesn't need to be, listen, you don't need to hire a, a consultant for six months to figure out how you're going to do something like that. But it's like, yeah, there's like a couple key pillars um, that you want to move people through. Um, and I think also part of it is, do you have a sponsor that's helping move people, you know, and that's where I think, you know, there's this element of change leadership that I think is really important. It's not just, you know, change management is about the process. Change leadership is about how you motivate people towards the change. And that's the harder part, right? Is getting people excited about, Hey, like, you know, you might not like this new tech, but in a future state, your life's going to be easier and we're going to be more connected and we're all going to be on one system. You know, there's lots of, there's lots of good stuff in that. Why? But if you don't, help people understand it and you don't have some of those key pillars they're just gonna you know wake up and feel like you've made their life a lot more difficult unnecessarily right amanda what is culture oh this is this is so deep and philosophical uh, i know right I, I i like it i like it i think i i always think of culture as the kind of observed behaviors that you see in an organization. It's not, you know, again, it typically cascades from your values, but it's, it's, it's much deeper than that. And I, I think, you know, so many companies have invested in making culture totally predicated on their office. And we certainly have as well. I mean, we have a really nice office. We have a ping pong table. We have a beer fridge. We have the cappuccino machine. Like the, the so, typical, uh, the typical so cliche, stuff. right? That's right. You got a bean uh, bag, all that kind you, of stuff. You, you got it, right? You have to be competitive to some extent, but yeah, it's a bit cliche. Now. All, all bean bags uh, bigger than, than other companies come work for us. Yes, that's right. That's right. Or maybe they have our logo on it, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, no. So, um, but, but the, the challenge that organizations faced is that when COVID hit, they didn't have that to be the cornerstone of their culture anymore. And so 
what happened is that, you know, the, the deep parts of culture were actually exposed and that's where companies really struggled or they didn't. And, you know, I think there's, you know, the concept of the iceberg of culture. And so, you know, what you see at your office and on your website is on the very top, but what's underneath is actually the true observed behaviors. And so, you know, I think the investments that we had made in, you know, how do we hire great people? How do we train our managers to be effective? How do we give feedback? How do we ensure um, compensation is fair and equitable for people from diverse backgrounds? You know, those were key pillars of culture that we had invested in that actually most people didn't see, right? Because you don't like it just exists underneath and it's just, you know, kind of the, the, the deep parts of your culture. But what happened for us is that when we removed our office and we didn't have the cool ping pong table and, you know, the beer fridge and all that stuff, we found that our culture still existed and it existed in a different format. Like, I'm not going to lie. It was obviously super tough for people (laughs) and really challenging to navigate what it, what it looked like. And it felt like, but, you know, I think those observed behaviors and seeing people come together was so, um, encouraging to see that, you know, even when you remove that environment, the culture still lives and people are still helpful and they're still customer centric and they're still working together. Um, you know, is, is so inspiring. And I, I think companies that, you know, invested in really nice offices and maybe didn't invest in some of that other stuff, um, really struggled during COVID because when people didn't have a nice office, they could just go to any other company because it didn't matter. They're working remote. They didn't feel that connection, um, to the culture. That's, that's so important. Um, I I think another part for me is I, I often said, and I always joke with people that they eye roll at me, but, you know, I I really think that culture is owned by everyone. I I think, you know, maybe it sits in someone's title and, you know, maybe I'm responsible for reporting up key metrics around our culture, but at the end of the day, you know, you're one person or one team, you know, what's more important is to create an environment where people feel, you know, again, to create the conditions, uh, where people want to be part of the culture where, you know, people want want to be engaged, um, and try things. I mean, I, I, I don't think it's that, that, that hard to give people a little bit of budget to try something. Um, you know, we had a hot, hot summer, uh, um, pre pre COVID and our graphic designer turned to me during lunch and she said, why don't we have ice cream day? And I said, I don't know. Why don't we? And she was like, are you serious? And I was like, I'll just give you a budget. It's not going to be that much. Um, doesn't need to be that much. Um, and they created an ice cream buffet. You know, the HR team didn't need to be involved because they wanted to take the initiative and they, they took it. I mean, I think with their budget, which I think was maybe $300, it wasn't a lot, but they got like a chocolate fountain, as many chocolate flavors, they got vegan ice cream, they got all the toppings. And it was like such a small thing, but it it doesn't actually require a big investment, but it, it requires you to be open that, you know, you don't own a thing that no one can really see right? Like it's owned by everyone. And I think that, that, that goes back to that principle of how we built Resolver in the first place. Amanda, what's your process for implementing great leadership programs? Um, it, it really starts, um, you know, very similar to what you're talking about with even implementing change um, at the not-for-profit where you're at, but it's just, yeah, it's what are the needs of our leaders? You have to start there, right? So, you know, really looking at what do people need and where do we want to go? What does it mean to be a leader, not, you know, a quarter from now, but a year from now, you know, so you have to be able to stretch towards current and understand where we currently are to future state. So always needs analysis starts, Um, you know, for us, actually a key thing um, that we really found is that, you know, people were, um, you know, needed, needed support to have conversations that were difficult over Zoom. So it's like, okay, well, there's something around, you know, the performance conversation piece, but then how do you elevate it a little bit more in a remote world? So, you know, doing the needs analysis, understanding what you need for the future state. And and part of that also typically involves looking at the leadership competencies that you want to build. Um, You know, we, we did a bit of an analysis and we kind of said, okay, when we think of leaders who 
are maybe now managers and are going to be directors and level up, you know, what are the four or five things we feel we really, they really need. So, you know, on top of coaching and team development, you know, they need to be good at, they need to be good at, you know, building um, plans and building programs. They need to be really good at critical thinking and data analysis. So, you know, understanding both what we currently have as well as where we want to go and then determining the methodology that needs to make that true, right? I, I mean, you can formalize a program and make it, you know, workshops, but sometimes it's actually better done by uh, a coach. It's better done by someone that's just going to work with that person one-on-one. -on -one. Um, sometimes it's also better done by an external organization that just really knows how to do this stuff. Um, but I, I think once, you know, however you decide to execute on that program, you know, you have to have a mechanism for doing the follow-up because I think where so many training programs fall short is you do really great at the workshop. You get everyone in a room, everyone gets really excited. They've got some great cookies. They feel the rah rahs, but then they leave and you don't remember anything. So what's the plan after? And actually probably 80% of your program is the coaching and development you do after. How do you help self-reflect, people self-reflect on how they've progressed? How do you hold them accountable? You know, we've set up systems where we've had accountability partners where people, you know, are paired up with someone and they actually say, how am I doing? You know, I commit it to these four goals and I actually haven't moved it. <laughs> so does this matter or does it not the important goal anymore? Or do I need to get my act together? Right. So I, I think really making sure you're holding someone accountable and then determining how you will see that uh, evaluate the outcome. So both for the business as well as the program, right? So what most people do is they evaluate the program, right? So it's like, did you like this leadership development program? Yes, no, you are satisfied. You learned some stuff. Great. Um, you know, uh, those are, those are helpful to do, but if they're not, you know, done with some link to a business metric, then it could just be a smile sheet. So, you know, what are the actual outcomes that you're trying to drive? Are you trying to drive, you know, higher employee satisfaction by manager? Are you trying to drive higher employee retention by manager? Are you trying to drive, you know, outcomes related to the effectiveness of the team based on manager? You know, you've got to kind of break it down and really understand, you know, what is the impact of a manager and how are we going to see it? So, you know, I think those are, those are kind of the key pillars. It's obviously, you know, easy to say conceptually, I've seen it done in varying degrees in practice. Um, but that's generally the, 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 um, the flow that I, that I follow, but yeah, that, that needs analysis, um, you know, determining how you want to execute it, implementing it and evaluating it also important to make sure your leaders are going to be successful. But, um, I, I often use the, the gym analogy, right? Like it's like, you know, you, you, you sign up to go to the gym, the workshop is the first day, right? Right. Where you get really excited and you have one session with the personal trainer, but no one gets fit because they went to one session, right? <laughs> they got, you get fit and you get, you know, really effective as a coach because you're, you've created a habit and you're accountable to that habit and you're constantly monitoring for growth around that habit. And I think, you know, coaching is absolutely a skill set you can develop in your leaders. Um, but it's something that, you know, has to come with a level of rigor. So Amanda, let's suppose you have six managers, six different teams, like six teams mm -hmm. are doing kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. How do you like do, do the thin line between making sure they're competitive, but also being collaborative? That's a great question. I, I think, I think you create, um, I think you create healthy competition by, you know, you all have a common goal. Um, it's just that each of them might get to it in a different way. And I, I think you have to make sure people know that they have some wiggle room in how they achieve it. And that's where the creativity comes, right? So if you're going to, if you're going to run, um, some sort of contest, it's like, you know, just giving everyone to say, okay, like you have an equal amount of budget, go, go run at it. Let's figure it out. Or you have an equal amount of resources, go run at it and you can figure it out. I, I, I think I'm a big fan of healthy competition. Um, I think it's a fun way to engage people. I think sometimes a little bit of, uh, uh, um, you know, 
like smack talk is probably good because it motivates uh, I, people. I, yes, I, I definitely agree with that. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's always knowing people's intent. And I think, you know, when you have a great team and you genuinely like working with other each other, you're going to know the smack talk is just like you trying to motivate each other. Um, and so it's, it's not coming from a bad place, but yeah, I think it's like set a common goal and, you know, give people, um, give people the, the encouragement to know they have wiggle room and let them, let them go, let them go see what happens. So next let's talk about gender pay. I know the United States, the first equal pay law was passed back in 1938. Mm -hmm. Almost hundred years later, we still kind of get it right. So I have a couple of theories. One theory is like a company hires Tom and Mary often both 50,000. I think staff are so that Tom's going to go, Hey, no, 50,000 not enough. I need more, need more money. So he'll get, instead of 50,000, he starts at 60,000. I think staff will show that Mary will say, thank you very much and be at 50,000. So right off the bat is, you know, disparity. And then they work for a year, they both get 10% raises the next year. Of course, that's, you know, another big difference. But I think something even bigger is this. Like, I think stats show, like, if Tom's working six months, he's going to go to the manager, hey, I've been, and this is a slight exaggeration on both instances. Tom goes to his boss, hey, I've been on time every day. I need a raise. Okay, I'll give you a raise. Where Mary, you know, in her six months, she like pulled in a $250 million contract, increased this, did that, whatever. And she'll say, oh, I'm just doing my job right. I, I know a couple of tech startups were, what they're doing is like, they have a philosophy like, there's no negotiation and no, like on, only we give raises out. So I don't know if that's the answer to that or not. I don't know if I agree with that or not. So what's, what's your thoughts on those, on those, on the gender pay and all that involved with that? Cause it's a complicated issue. For sure. Yeah, I think, I think a big part of it is you know, really standing on process equity. So, you know, for, for us, we, we have a process and, you know, when we review people's compensation, we look at, we look at three factors. We look at um, market equity. So we look at what are people in comparable roles on market being paid because that will shift over time. Um, and, you know, it's not, not everyone in the same job needs to be paid the same amount, but there's a range on market that those people need to make. I think the second thing that we look at is internal equity. So what are people in similar roles being paid? And then the final thing we look at is diversity equity, right? We look at what are people who come from different backgrounds who are, um, um, you know, women or, or people from diverse backgrounds, what are they being paid relative to their peers? And so we have kind of three checkpoints that we look at and, and we take that process you know, seriously, um, when we review it, we're very diligent on it. Um, and we're always cross indexing that against performance because, you know, we really pride ourselves on being a performance organization. So, you know, that, that has to be the number one factor is, you know, is someone performing well, are they, are they really achieving the, the metrics that they've set out? So, when you look at those things, and and for most of our organization, we're looking at those data points twice a year. It's 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 a big investment that you make, but when you think about the time your um, HR team needs to put into that versus the time it would take to recruit people, it's you know just becomes part of your retention strategy. And so you know we communicate what our process is. You know when people have a situation where they're, you know, looking for an increase, we typically go back to, well, this is our process. And this is why we've made this decision. Um, we, we're, we're flexible. You know, there's times where the market has shifted pretty rapidly and maybe we've done an off cycle increase for a cohort of people. But when we are, are as a principal, if we see a cohort of um, employees, we see the market is shifting rapidly. And, you know, for example, in, in technology, there's, you know, very specific roles where, you know, an employer will come in and just pay gobs of money for those people. So, you know, we'll see the market shift. And so if we see that, we're not going to, we're not just going to raise up the person that brought it to our attention that said, hey, by the way, just so you know, we're going to look at the whole cohort and we're going to say, listen, this whole group needs to be adjusted, not just the person that raised it to us, because that's a market condition that has changed and, and it's going to impact our business. So I, I think it's, I think it's, you know, both having a process, communicating the process, as well as, you know, looking at the cohort and not just the individual is, is how we've addressed it. Um, certainly, you know, it's an easy decision to make to say we're going to pay people a little bit more to keep them. It also means that maybe we can't hire um, you know, another, another person for that team, 
right? So it's like, okay, that's, you know, that's a decision that, you know, the HR team needs to work on with the business leader. You know, we could say, okay, we have a budget, you know, we all, we all operate within the confines of a, <laughs> a balance sheet. And, you know, sometimes that is a trade-off you're going to make, you know, it's more value to the, certainly more value to the company to retain, you know, five people and to give them increases than it is to hire the next net new person. So that's the decision we have to make. Um, so that's the hard part of business, right? Because it would be easy if you just had the endless funds and you could just always be reviewing people's, you know, comp four times a year. Um, obviously, that's not super practical. So, you know, our review is um, twice a year. We we deliver once a year, um, but certainly we have been flexible to market because that's just the reality. You have to be. So I, I think where a lot of companies get challenged is they're not rigorous with their process, and I think it's I think it's really hard because. As a manager, when you hear someone say, I want more money and they're a good performer, um, you, you, you know, people don't like to say no, right? So I think it's about understanding, you know, talk to me about, you know, if money weren't part of what you're looking for at this point, you know, what would you need to want to stay? you know, and what would you need to want to continue to grow and develop with us? And, you know, this is when our comp cycle is and let's, let's have a conversation then. Um, and I'll be honest, there certainly have been instances where people have just got really great pay opportunities. And we've kind of said to them, listen, like you should probably take that. <laughs> like that is a very, very good salary. And, and, you know, maybe that's the thing that you need. I mean, we're, we're also really open about the fact that, you know, as you were saying before, like people have mortgages, they have bills and, you know, we, we have what we have in terms of our, you know, our, our company expenses. And if it makes more sense for someone to take another opportunity, the thing that I always impress on them is, you know, every dollar comes with more expectation. And so just understand what you, what you really care about. Um, because most people, when you hit a certain point, it doesn't, money is not the issue. It's more, it's the money and the culture and the growth and the great people. Um, but there's certainly times in your life where the, the money's going to matter a ton more. And if that's the point in your life that you're at, I think also sometimes as an employer, you, you have to know when someone has a very good offer that they should probably, you know, take that next leap. Uh, isn't it, I think the general rule is like whatever dollar, whatever you make in one dollar, the company expects two dollars of value from you. So like if your salary is hundred thousand dollars, the company's gonna like it's not a nonprofit, right? They, they'll expect like two hundred thousand dollars of value from yeah. you some kind of way. Totally. Yeah. There's like, there's certainly like employee um, value stats that you can do, which generally says, yeah, like you you can look at someone's quota and then you can say based on their quota, how much would you how much value do they bring? It just gets so much harder to monetize when you're a knowledge-based worker. That's maybe like, like even you're, you know, an engineer or you're in QE or you're in product, like that is so hard to monetize. Um, but yeah, I just generally think, yeah, companies are looking for impact and, you know, we've seen this, we've seen this in, in, in certain markets where certainly there's been, you know, technology companies that have, you know, been in positions with their financial backers to pay really big salaries. And then, you know, as, as we, you start going into a recession, people get nervous and they've had to lay off, um, you know, big, big groups of people. And so, you know, it's super unfortunate when that happens, but it's definitely, you know, a market effect where you just have to understand that, you know, those, those dollars are typically going to come with something and, and having a business that's very, that's run very effectively operationally is, is super important. Yeah. I think another challenge too, with that, with that, with the equal pay is, and it's, you know, it's a challenge and you know, it's because lack of information, lack of education, just not knowing, like you have to like, we'll say, Mary will say, Hey, you know, my friend, Tom, I get paid this amount for my job. My friend Tom is getting paid the same, like twice my amount, right? Which is bad, but you do dig a little deeper. Mary works for a company that has 50 people in a small town in you know, Nebraska, where Tom works for Amazon in Seattle, right? And like people don't really understand labor markets, I don't think, right? Totally. Yeah, we, we, we have tried to work hard with people to help them understand how we look at compensation, because again, I think it's, you know, give people the information so they understand why we're, why and how we're making decisions. Um, certainly a trend I've seen in a bunch of, or uh, a bunch of industries, but tech is probably very guilty is just title inflation. You know, you'll see people that are, you know, um, directors or VPs and they yeah. have no direct reports. They have no yeah. P and L's. Be, 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 like, a, be okay. a tech startup, tech startup <laughs> with five people, the VP of everyone's a VP. Yes. 
Yes. You actually should be mad if you're not a VP at that, that, that company of that size. Right. So yeah, I, I agree. And that's, that's a conversation we have to have. I actually, um, you know, uh, one thing is we we're scaling the business is we were very rigorous around how we thought about leveling people and what it meant to be a team lead, a manager, a director. And we got a lot of flack for it. People were like, I'm not even a director. My friend over there works at a different company and they're a director. It's like, okay, well, this is what a director does at our business. You know, they, they oversee a PL, they own it, they're accountable for it. They have this many direct reports. Is that you? So, you know, we just had to go back to that kind of process equity and make sure people understood why we made, why, why we were rigorous about those decisions. Um, I have a peer that was working at another tech company. And when she joined, there are about 200 people and uh, she wanted to meet the leadership. So she asked, you know, she asked the coordinator, she said, can you just get everyone that's manager and above into the boardroom at three? I just want to meet people. So she rocked in and she said about 70% of the company was in the boardroom and she kind of looked around and was like, whoa, I got a lot of work to do around calibrating people's titles about setting expectations. Because of course, you know, the, the, the company had made the decision to give people titles to retain them. But the challenge is, is those titles don't necessarily have substance. Um, and, and then what happens is then you sometimes set that expectation for the next job um, that the person wants that title or above. Um, so it, it can be really tricky um, for people on market, you know, when, when you are part of title inflation. So I, I think you're spot on, you know, certainly understanding the size of the company, the revenue of the company, the employee count of the company, it's all, you know, a reflection of what title um, that they're going to have. And so recruiters need to dig into that a little bit and, and, and look at those titles. I, I've certainly had circumstances, you know, we were hiring for a manager recently and the recruiter said to me, oh, well, this person's a senior director. They're not going to want to make a move. And I said, well, how big is the company? And, you know, do you know their revenue? And then once you unpack that, it's like, yeah, no, that's, that's definitely what we would call a manager or they just happen to work for a smaller company. So I think this is where recruiters also need to be super aware of that and dig in to make sure they're calibrating um, as they're doing that market research. I mean, before you know, you have a VP, ex executive VP, senior VP, super uh, senior associate, VP. Associate, VP. Yeah, I know. It's just like, you know, how many rungs can you go up, right? So yeah, no, it's it's something it's something to be super mindful of, you know? And it, and and again, like it's, it's one strategy that sometimes companies will use if they can't necessarily give more compensation as they'll give title. Um, but you know that the expectation of comp with title is going to quickly follow. So this just, just goes back to the principle of being able to have courageous conversations and just kind of say, hey, this is how we we envision the role and the title. And, you know, it's not to say that we don't think that we can, you know, advance you and you can get to that level, but you know, that you have to be looking at the sociology of the business, not just the psychology of what do you want? It's like, what does the system need um, to be effective as an organization? Amanda, what's your advice to brand new HR people? My best advice is learn and understand the business and the business metrics that you can support. Yeah. So many people get that wrong. Yeah. I, I just, you know, if you don't understand what makes your business tick and what they're trying to achieve, you know, how can you support them with their most important investment, which is their people. And so, you know, I think um, one of the things that I've certainly had an opportunity to do in a couple companies I've worked at is just understand the operation, understand a profit and loss statement. You know, how does the business make money, right? Like that's that's a really seems like. Um, you know, a pretty simple concept, but I think a lot of people in, in, uh, who are starting their journey in HR don't really, don't really internalize that. So understanding what makes the business tick is so important. It's how you're going to be seen as a business leader and not just an HR leader. Um, because I truly believe, um, people that sit on top of HR functions are leaders in the business. Um, but it's our job to make sure we know the business to make that be true. And I'd like to say that, you know, HR is to me the only business function function is going to take touch each employee from beginning to end, right? I don't think any business, other business function to say that, right? Yeah, no, totally. That's a that's a really really good point. Yeah, and I think you know also 
um, you know, to that, to that point, you know, having people early in their HR careers really, you know, understand data is so important. It's also, uh, it's a team where you're rich in data. You have so many data points, right? From, from recruiting, from um, onboarding and through employee journey into, into exits, you know, there's, there's just data all around you, but are you gathering this data um, to drive an insight to say, Hey, did you know that, you know, the last 30% of people who left, they cited their manager as the number one reason, or they cited compensation as the number one reason, like, you know, whatever that, that thing is, that's making people go, well, first of all, how do you get to that earlier? So they don't make that decision, but then how do you build programs to support and make that different? So, you know, I also think after understanding the business, just capitalize on all the data you sit on. I mean, we're, we're probably one of the most data rich teams in an organization. And I think too often, um, you know, we're looking at some pretty, pretty, um, you know, pretty, uh, foundational metrics that get us started, but I, I just think it's, it can be so rich and it really helps us, um, make an impact for the business. It often also helps us get more funding. Um, an analysis that I did, um, was I was looking at, you know, compensation and what our potential compensation increase pool was, was, um, was potentially, um, should be. And I looked at it relative to the cost of turnover, um, so of course the CFO didn't look how I monetized, uh, the cost of turnover. So I took a low number and a high number, but I said, even if you take the low number, the cost of turnover is still much lower than my, you know, projected compensation pool. Um, and that becomes compelling. And if you understand how a CFO works, um, <laughs> and what they care about, then that's going to make it a lot easier to get that investment because it is an investment, right? It's an investment in the long term of your business, um, through your people. Um, it's sometimes being able to, to just take that data and make a great story out of it. Amanda, what's your reaction when you hear HR people say, I do HR, I don't do, I don't do numbers. Oh, that one's so tricky for me because I, my brain doesn't always work that way. Um, I, I just think, you know, numeracy is part of almost every job we have now, right? Like even salespeople need to be super numerate in terms of, you know, how they look at their sales funnel and their deals and their business. It's, it's so much more than just building great relationships. Um, so, you know, I think, I think to an HR person that says, I just want to do numbers, then they're just, they have to acknowledge that they're not going to have a seat at the table um, because uh, numbers are the great equalizer across functions. So from sales to finance, to um, engineering, marketing, all of those teams speak numbers. And, you know, as I said, we have such a rich data set that you can be, you know, you can, you can be just as strong a voice and advocate at the table when you have the data. Um, you know, it, it does, it does, it's, it's an investment. You have to learn it. You know, I, I certainly have taken courses, um, on finance, on, you know, finance for non-finance professionals, you know, looking at a PL statement, looking at a, a balance sheet, you know, those are all, those are all skill sets that I, I, is not in the traditional, um, HR wheelhouse. It's kind of the old HR, new HR, um, um, split you're talking about before, but I think, you know, new, new HR does think in numbers. They do think in data because it's so rich to drive the insight towards business growth, um, that how could you ignore it? So Amanda, next, what advice do you have for people looking for jobs now, and especially HR people trying to find a job? I think when HR people are looking for a job, they should be, um, they should do a lot of investigation into the leadership team of the organization and understand what those leaders believe because it it really you know as much as as much as HR can influence from the bottom up it also is top down right so you know do, does the leadership of the organization you're looking to choose, you know, have values that align with you? Do they talk positively about people? Do people talk positively about them? 
you know, um, you know, what is, what is their brand when it comes to people, um, ask around, you know, those are all things that matter because, you know, as, as you, as you talked about before with tech leaders who are making, you know, unethical decisions, I mean, that's, you know, HR is going to end up eating that at some point. So if you're, you're, you know, one of the reasons I chose resolver is because I really aligned with the leadership team. And I think that's such a key part of, you know, a choice an HR leader um, can make. It's the difference between an organization that's going to invest in growing its people or is going to see you as, you know, a back-end office administrator um, who buys cake once a month. I mean, that's that's not who we are. That's not who we want to be. So you have to have a leadership team that also, you know, believes that you truly are a driver for business through culture. Yeah, HR event people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so next, what do you see as some future challenges for the HR profession? I think the, um, the employee base continues to um, be more um, complex and, and HR leaders need to understand how to serve uh, a community of, of employees that is more complex. Um, you know, COVID certainly had people talking about mental health more than ever. Um, you, you know, um, the, the racial injustice around Black Lives Matter had conversations around race, you know, come into the workplace that, you know, some organizations steered, steered away from. Um, you know, certainly um, the trans community has also, you know, continued to supplement the, the conversation of LGBTQ communities. And so I, I, I think, you know, we, we, we have a employee group that is more and more vocal about what they believe in and which is which is a great shift you know so many times people had two lives you know the the, the person they are at home and the person they come to work with and I, I think that is you know very blurry now and I think people feel a lot more empowered to bring their 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 genuine selves to work and so what that means for an HR leader is you're just dealing with more complexity you know you're dealing with you know um, issues that are visible and invisible you know, and, 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 you know, some things you just, you just can't see in their range of abilities um, of, of people that you have on your team. And so I think understanding how to navigate that and be really human about it um, and still achieve business results is super complex. And I think we're all kind of trying to figure it out. I, I don't know a company who says they have a total slam dunk on this yet um, because it is so emergent and, it, and it's, you know, a, a lot of it is just learning, you know, how do you, how do you serve that, that employee, employee base and how do you make sure you're enabling them to be human um, and also do great work. I think we used to be a lot, a lot more, um, divide it in, in terms of, again, home and life. And that's not as binary anymore. It's, it's a lot more gray. So we're going to continue to have to push ourselves to work in the gray and really support employees. Amanda, best you can, can you talk about how Resolver got started? What, what y'all focus on now and what's the future vision for the company moving forward is? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we, we grew up um, through uh, an acquisition of Resolver, who is a Toronto-based company that was working in the, um, the governance, risk, and compliance space. And then the leader in the corporate security space, who is PPM 2000, based in Edmonton. And so we were, we were uh, had a, a venture backing to bring those two businesses together. And the thesis was um, that there's a way we can gather insights about a company's risks to help them, you know, protect their people and their brand and their assets. And so, you know, we built an incredible no-code technology to help solve that um, for, you know, amazing companies around the world. And we've continued to evolve. Um, and now we've really evolved um, uh, to a place where we, you know, we have a platform that gathers all risk data and analyzes it in context. And what it's really trying to do is help reveal the business impact of risk. And so, you know, risk teams are often disconnected. They're seen actually much like HR teams <laughs> as, you know, uh, backend administrative people, but we really view, you know, risk is a driver of opportunity. 
And, you know, COVID certainly taught us that understanding risk is a key element of decision-making. I mean, how often did you talk about your level of risk tolerance around the dinner table over the past two years? You probably didn't talk about that ever <laughs> before in your life. Um, and so certainly we're, we're, we're proud to have evolved our technology to be a risk intelligence um, platform that we believe is making an incredible impact for companies around the, the globe. So, you know, we started as this, you know, relatively small, um, um, Canadian tech company operating in two Canadian offices when I started um, to evolve to be, you know, a true player in the risk intelligence space um, operating around the globe. Um, so we've been on a, a great journey. It's a journey of scale. Um, we were we are recently acquired by Kroll. Um, and so, you know, we've been through that journey. We acquired three businesses and now we've been an acquiree, um, which to comes from a totally different lens of, of change management um, and change leadership. Um, but, you know, the, the ongoing um, thesis for our work is we have an incredible amount of value to offer our customers when they're able to see risk and they're able to, you know, um, determine how those risks make an impact on their business. And so it's been, it's been quite a ride um, so far and we're, we're looking ready, we're looking forward to our next period of growth. Um, I think certainly, you know, we've been acquired by a company that is, I think it's around 5,000 people. Um, so very different. Um, so we're still learning, you know, what is our culture gonna look like um, um, in a, a, as part of a, a division of a very big company. Um, so I'm excited for that opportunity. I think there's an incredible amount we have to learn. They have a ton of expertise on their side. Um, so now it's just, you know, do, doing the, doing the thing we do best <laughs> learning, being agile, um, and testing things out, you know, so much of how we've built our, our business has been, um, you know, testing things. I have certainly learned that as we built culture, you know, change can feel really slow sometimes, as I've said, that integration can feel slow, but it can also happen really quickly. And so I think it's just, you know, as an organization and as a, as a culture, always being ready for change, um, and, and knowing that that with change brings opportunity um, is truly part of our ethos is that's going to bring us to our next stage. Amanda, is there anything else that I asked you that I haven't asked you or is there anything else you want to talk about? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think, um, I think one thing that that certainly comes to mind is, you know, uh, I was asked this recently, asked, actually, what what I personally look for when I'm hiring people uh, on 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 my team. Um, um, so I thought it was actually someone asked this to me in an interview. So I was interviewing them, and I always leave lots of time for them to ask me questions. <laughs> so they asked me it, and I just had to scale back and think about it um, a, a little bit. But it, it, it came down to you know, finding someone, you know, I, I tend to try to hire people that are really conscientious. You know, I think it's, you know, they, they follow up, they, they follow great, um, uh, direction. They're very, you know, uh, keen, um, people who are curious that want to continue to learn, um, people who are really good at critical thinking, um, and solving problems. And then people that are coachable. I, I think the the adage of hiring for attitude is so important, but it's also hiring um, for kind of what we talked about at the top of the conversation. People that are willing to um, both receive and give feedback, and you know, learn through their journey is so critical for someone's ongoing success. So I guess I would add that to your earlier question of what should HR. Uh, people who are early in their HR careers um, do to get ready and be prepared for their first job, um, you know, know what that company is looking for. But, you know, I think you'd be hard pressed to find uh, a company that wasn't looking for people that were, you know, had a growth mindset and were open to being coached and, and, and learning. Um, because when you do that and you're in the right environment, your capacity to grow is, is you know, um, is exponential. Amanda, can you give us your social media so people can reach out to you? Absolutely. I'm definitely best on LinkedIn. I, I you know, I still wear the recruiting hat a, a bunch of the time. So uh, I'm just backslash Amanda Ono. There's not many of us uh, out there, luckily for my parents. And so, yeah, no, you can definitely find me on LinkedIn, keen to, to connect with people um, and, you know, answer questions that, that people have um, in that regard, for sure. And yeah, for listeners, we have the links to our social media in the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cavernstakeshallblog.com. Be sure to share this episode with your friends and be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to Jason Cabinet's experience. 
So Amanda, we're coming to the end of our talk. Can you give us any last minute wisdom or advice on any subject you want to talk about? Any subject. I love this. <laughs> um, you know, I would, I would say that is, you know, no matter if you're in HR or, you know, what your, um, um, you know, where, where your next journey goes to, you know, we kind of start at the top of the conversation talking about traveling um, and talking about, you know, how we build culture and HR and, and grow as leaders. But, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's always looking um, to develop and to grow um, as uh, empathetic humans. I think empathy, you know, for the employee base, for your customer base, for humans in general, um, whether you're, you know, traveling to, to Thailand or uh, in, in Toronto, I think it makes such an impact on how you can connect with people and how you can really foster a long-term relationship. So I would just kind of encourage people to continue to look inside. Um, empathy is sometimes hard because it challenges how we see the world and sometimes feels uncomfortable, but, you know, it's such a key part of, of growth for both, um, you know, businesses as well as individuals. So yeah, that, that would be my, my key, uh, advice other than just eat lots of fruits and vegetables. <laughs> Amanda, thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. That was great. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.